Great. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is building the economic and business case for investing in ecosystem restoration. And I'm going to bring in a few examples from very different parts of the world. Henrik, I'm very privileged that Henrik will be following me and talking about Norway. But let me really try and address this question from a global perspective. Ah, of course, it would be too easy, here we go, to think we wouldn't have technical problems. As we enter the UN decade on, UN, on ecosystem restoration, how are we actually going to translate these principles and strategies and pathways from rhetoric into reality? We've got some fantastic targets. We've got some fantastic commitments at the global level, at the national level, at the regional level. But how are we going to make them work? It, it's a complicated jigsaw puzzle, that's for sure. I just want to look at one piece of this jigsaw puzzle. And the piece I want to look at is specifically making the economic and business case. And as I talk about this and as I pull in some of the lessons learned and experiences from around the world, I guess I really want to sort of tell a little story. And my story starts with the problem of ecosystem undervaluation. I think this is a huge problem for ecosystem restoration. I want to talk about the fact that as we value ecosystem services, it can really help. And sometimes that's enough to make the case for restoration. But actually, we need to go further, not just numbers, not just figures. We need to tailor that evidence to the people we want to convince. And we need to actually turn those values, turn those ecosystem benefits into real and tangible incentives and finance if we're going to move forwards in building a convincing case. So let's start with the first part of the story. This first part of the story is a rather depressing one, and it's one which I think all of us face as a challenge affecting our work, and for sure it must affect ecosystem restoration. This is something we can all close our eyes and probably say off by heart. Ecosystem services, the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. But what I'm really concerned about is this nexus or these links. We in our field may be very aware of the extremely high economic value of ecosystem services for economic, human and social well-being. But many of the decision makers and land users and investors who are either causing ecosystem degradation or failing to invest in ecosystem restoration aren't. And undervaluation poses a huge challenge for that very reason that this nexus, this link between ecosystem service and human well-being doesn't typically come into the calculations that are used to guide land and resource and investment planning. What are we going to do with this forest land? Well, what are the values? Timber, clear felling it for timber, converting it to a more productive or economic use. This tendency to only look at the tip of the iceberg by undervaluing ecosystem services, we're also ignoring the vast majority of the iceberg, the vast majority of the values. What does it mean? It means if we're undervaluing ecosystem services, we're making decisions, well, at best on partial information, at worst on very flawed information. We're not seeing ecological restoration, ecosystem conservation, nature-based solutions and the like emerging as profitable land resource or investment options. And this is resulting in huge missed economic opportunities and costs, let alone the ecological and conservation and scientific implications. And so I think again and again over time, we've actually seen restoration considered as an economic disinvestment, 
we might think it's self-evident that restoration is actually a positive investment that yields many returns for society and the economy. But that's not how public and political debate portray it. It's a luxury. It's land out of production. It's unaffordable. It doesn't meet our immediate needs for development. And how do we correct that? Well, we're starting to see some really interesting figures come out that are specifically on the restoration economy. This was on a study carried out about five years ago in the USA. This doesn't even look at the ecological benefits of restoration. It looks at ecosystem restoration in terms of the economic impacts. It's a $9.5 billion industry generating many, many jobs and sales outputs and employment earnings. And this was a revelation because many of the political arguments which were being made in the USA against ecosystem restoration were founded on the fact we need to generate jobs, we need to generate income, we need to generate economic multipliers, little realizing that actually ecosystem restoration generates all these benefits. It, it was it was actually a really interesting study. It looked at ecological restoration in national parks and on other public lands. And it even looked at these direct economic benefits of the ecological restoration economy, even down to specific species and habitats and restoration. And this actually started to do an amazing job in terms of shifting the public investment priorities and pressing the political buttons which were needed to make the case and perhaps more importantly, mobilize the public funding for restoration. Now, of course, once you factor in the ecosystem service co-benefits, that investment return becomes even higher. And I want to pick up something that Bob Stills was talking about earlier. Let's look at land degradation. The economic costs of land degradation and conversely, the flip side of the coin, the economic benefits of land restoration are immense. It's billions. Look at cropland and pasture land. Tens of billions of dollars a year. That's just the provisioning services. That's just the direct market benefits. Once we look at the full ecosystem values, we're going up by a factor of four, five, or even more times. How do we convey those values to make the case? It can be a very compelling case. Sticking, this is the arguments for forest restoration to combat soil erosion in Iran. Once you start overcoming those challenges of a lack of information on ecosystem service values, you can get some very compelling arguments. You can get some very compelling figures that actually, what do we see here? The costs of soil erosion in Iran are actually at a minimum equivalent to the oil exports in the same year. Now, definitely advances in ecosystem valuation have helped both to question the economic wisdom of business as usual, i.e avert the need for ecosystem restoration, but they've also helped to strengthen the case for ecosystem restoration. There are some wonderful examples from across the world of how these kind of ecosystem value figures have been used, including some fantastic work, which I guess Henrik's going to talk about in Norway, and some fantastic work from your very institution, the David Bartons and the other colleagues are well known for the amazing work on ecosystem valuation. And sometimes these economic arguments, these valuation studies are enough. I, I want to use one example from Java in Indonesia, the north coast of Java. And this little sign says one mangrove saves five lives in coastal areas. So here the need was to demonstrate to the local municipality, to Bapanas, the Ministry of Planning, and to the politicians of the importance of mangrove restoration on an area of the coast which suffers horrifically 
from coastal erosion, leading, leading to huge economic costs in terms of loss of land, loss of property, loss of infrastructure, salinization of soil and water sources. But how to convince the local decision makers in the municipality and perhaps more importantly in the Ministry of Planning and the politicians that this is an economically and developmentally worthwhile option. Well, by demonstrating that actually nature-based solutions, ecosystem restoration is far more cost effective than the equivalent grey infrastructure, about four and a half times more cost effective, but it also gives a huge return on investment in terms of disaster risk reduction services. Spending $192,000 a year is going to leverage $1.2 million of disaster risk reduction services. But also, looking at the total figure, that's almost five times higher once you factor in all of those other ecosystem service co-benefits. Now, not only are they very important in making the development case, but they're very important convincing the politicians who in turn have to stand up for the livelihoods of their constituents and voters that there are many other benefits to restoring mangroves. In the case of this village in Demat Regency, this was actually enough to make the case to mobilise the local budget votes to invest in ecosystem restoration. So very often these kind of public interest economic value arguments are enough and they can exert a very powerful influence to shift the investment, land use planning, municipal priorities towards ecosystem restoration. And here, I think we're really talking about a case of recalculating, re-representing restoration benefits, moving away from this very market-driven model that's typically driven economic decision making, which just looks at the direct benefits generated by project activities or investments in a particular site. You know, just looking at what would happen in that particular place and what could be monetized as cash income. And rather saying the key thing about ecosystem restoration is this link to human well-being? Is this link to broader services? Is these multipliers which accrue across the economy and across society? And when we're thinking about the best way to allocate land or resource for investment funds, we've got to factor in this bigger picture, which goes beyond the market and goes beyond purely cash benefits to one particular group or site. And actually maybe going further than that, not just thinking about that by dem or demonstrating it, but factoring it in to the calculations and the equations and the processes that are used to assess costs and benefits. And this is an example from Northern Cameroon, where there was a need to actually demonstrate a cost benefit analysis, a conventional cost benefit analysis to the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of World Bank, Ministry of World Bank and the World Bank to convince them that they should be investing infrastructure funding in natural infrastructure, in floodplain infrastructure. And to do that, the Ministry of Finance and the World Bank didn't want to hear about broader economic multipliers. They wanted to see a hard return on investment according to their investment appraisal and cost benefit analysis requirements. So this is right up in the extreme north of Cameroon, a very dry area. The Lagoon River runs up there and irrigates a, a massive floodplain, about half of which is completely seasonally inundated. In the early 70s, an irrigation scheme was built at the base of the floodplain, which effectively reduced the flooding by half and destroyed most of the ecology of the floodplain. And not only did it have massive effects on, on habitats, species and ecological processes, but the high changes in the hydrological regime 
also led to enormous ecosystem service value losses to the local population, particularly related to all of those activities which are dependent on the flooding regime. So how do you make the case to the Ministry of Finance and the World Bank, who incidentally provided the financing for the irrigation scheme in the first place, that they also need to invest in the natural infrastructure which would restore this flooding regime? The answer is you have to go a step further. You have to show how hydrological and ecological restoration will actually deliver a profitable project and return on investment according to the World Bank and Ministry of Finance criteria. And in most cases, Bob alluded to this earlier, you can demonstrate this. But you have to leverage that broader understanding, that bigger picture thinking, which will put ecosystem values into the very narrow decision making frameworks that are conventionally used to make decisions. And so at one level, I think making the case is fundamentally to do with ensuring that ecosystem values are fully factored into the evidence base, but also the equations and calculations that are used to weigh up these alternative land, resource, funds, select what's the most beneficial, select what's the most cost effective. As long as we're suffering from the challenge of ecosystem valuation, these figures have not conventionally been being represented in decision making. And however much we may argue, market-based arguments, economic figures should not be the main criteria for decision making, they are. They're extremely powerful. And conventionally, they haven't factored in the whole iceberg. They've just looked at the tip. So I think we're seeing more and more good examples around the world of best practice in using ecosystem service valuation to make the case for restoration and to make the case for investing in ecological restoration. But of course, we have to go further plucking numbers out of a hat might be very nice and make, make a very strong case, but actually we're wanting to convince people or decision makers who have particular interests and agendas and mandates. So how do we tailor that evidence? And here is a very nice example from Serbia. The, the Bosset Forest is an amazing ancient oak and hornbeam forest just at the point where Croatia, Serbia and Bosnia joined together. And traditionally, or not traditionally, historically these forests are very much tied up with the local hydrological flooding regime. And they play a very important role also <clears throat> in stopping local flooding. They're, they're seasonally flooded forests and they play a very, very important role with their grassy glades and flooded areas in absorbing and buffering floodwaters. You can see this very graphically in the picture and, and, and protecting nearby settlements. For the last 20 to 30 years, the Bosset forests have been managed by the forest enterprise of Olvadinia Profit as a production forest. So the focus has been on timber production to the detriment of the local agricultural area and settlements which have suffered devastating flooding. So, so here the challenge was to convince the Volvadina province forest enterprise to shift towards a restorative forest regime which would not just restore more of a natural forest regime, forest landscape, forest ecology and hydrological regime away from a primary focus on forest production, but would also restore more traditional land use management practices, which would enable this much broader view of forest landscape management and restoration. Now, you, you, you can demonstrate very clearly that there will be a very good value added and avoided costs from forest landscape restoration and forest ecological restoration and forest management restoration. 
But of course, the forest enterprise of Ovadenia has no mandate to manage floodwaters. So they basically turned this down and said, no, our mandate and our revenue source is timber production. Forget it. We, we, we're not going to be investing in restoration. So here, I think a valuable lesson is you've also got to come up with the figures that are convincing to the people who are making those decisions. And the case of the Volvedina Forest Enterprise, this was to do with timber production. This was to do with hunting. This is to do with fishing, which is their mandate, which is their required outputs and which is their source of income. But it wasn't that simple. Although restoration had to be tailored to the land use managers and make good sense in relation to their needs and interests, they weren't the only decision makers that mattered. The restoration, forest restoration team in the Bosset Forests are actually, well, you can see them on the screen, they're these pigs. The, the forest restoration and the forest management regime that would restore these broader ecosystem services actually depends on local pig herding taking place in the forest. These happy pigs truffle about in the forest. They turn up the earth. They're rooting around for acorns and other things. And this is vital. What they're doing is they're playing a vital point in forest restoration, forest succession, opening up the glades, opening up the flooded areas, helping to maintain and clear the weeds and the invasive species and other things in the flooded areas, which are so vital, not for just maintaining the forest ecology and landscape, but also maintaining these essential hydrological functions. Now, there are clear incentives for the pigs to participate in restoration because they have a lot of tasty acorns and other food. But the question is, what about all the local pig herders? This is Melissa Malutin, who's one of the biggest pig owners. What's in it for him? So we don't just have to convince the forest enterprise of Olvedina province, but actually what's in it for Mr. Malutin, his neighbours and their pigs, the actual landscape restorers? Well, again, with a little bit of digging and with a little bit of thinking and with a little bit of thinking outside the box and outside the very narrow confines of traditional forest management decision making, potentially a lot. By employing the pigs full time as forest landscape managers and restorers, there's the potential to increase herd numbers, to reduce feed costs massively as the pigs are allowed back into the forest to root around and to increase local income in the area by a really quite significant amount of money each year. So here we get the economic case being taken on a stage further in terms of tailoring the evidence to the decision makers, to the needs, to convince those who need to be convinced to invest in restoration, even if it's just investing your pigs in restoration, that it does make sense. But again, of course, it wasn't that simple. Can Mr. Mutin and his neighbours actually capture those values? Can they capture the potential market of premium free range pork? Can they capture the higher prices? Do they know the technology? Will they get the rights? Will they get the management agreements, which will give them a secure livelihood option that they know they can be using the forest for the foreseeable future? Sadly, in this case, the answer was no. So after a very long process of convincing the forest enterprise, the water enterprise, the local farming representatives to shift over to this regime, actually, Mr. Putin and the other pig farmers said, it's not worth it. We can't capture those new markets. We can't make this money. And that also made the point that there was a need to go a lot further. Because however convinced the decision makers may be that it's in public interest to restore and conserve forest, forest it actually was going to have a minor impact unless Mr. Maroudin and his pigs and his neighbours had sufficient incentives and perceived that he sufficient gains from doing so.
And that's where, as economists, I think Henry will talk more about this. We don't just have to expand the evidence and the numbers and the perception of the market benefits, the non-market benefits that are at stake, but also the costs. Who's bearing the costs of restoration? What's of the net economic impact, positive and negative? We need to look at these broader benefits to make the case, but we also need to look at who's actually bearing the costs of ecological restoration and how we offset or balance these costs. And that means moving from a very narrow view to a much broader view, not just of the ecological restoration economy, but the economic stakeholders and livelihoods that are affected by it. And we have to look, how do we make restoration economically worthwhile and financially viable undertaking? Not just for the public investors or the government, but from the private land and resource users and managers who also gain benefits and incur costs. Who gains? Who gets the co-benefits? Who bears the costs, direct and indirect? And where are their gaps? As long as there are uncaptured values, we may be missing a vital economic opportunity. As long as there are uncompensated costs, like for Mr. Milton and his pigs, we may be failing to set in place a viable or sustainable ecological restoration scheme. As long as people's good work, like those of the pigs, are going unrewarded, it may be very difficult to sustain restoration over the long term. Uh, Lucy. Yes. Um, we have uh, some problems with the voice. Can you please turn off your video? Uh, maybe uh, the sound is better. Yes, I can. I will turn it up. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Yes, we okay. do. Okay. Can can you? Oh, I'm trying to input. So uh, I think if you turn off your camera, it might be better. Yes, it might be better. I will do that. OK, I've stopped the video. Can you hear me better? Yes. Yes, we do. OK, yes. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. It's, I think it's also just a, a hazard of the Internet connection is not always very good in Sri Lanka. And we are also just heading towards a very big storm. So I think that might have something to do with it. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. And now the voice okay. is good as well. Yes, please go on. OK, I, I wish everybody you could see outside my window. The sky is getting darker and darker and there's lightning flashing. So I hopefully the storm won't start. But always when that happens, we're in the monsoon season, the Internet connection gets worse. OK. Um, OK, I, I will. Um, should I just continue? I, I, I'm assuming that I might have been hard to hear, but did you manage to hear most of what I was saying? Yes, yes, just continue. That's fine. Okay, right. Okay, so, so, so yes, you know, we've got to overcome that problem of the fact that ecosystem services are horrifically undervalued in decision making. We have to represent those values better, but we also have to tailor them to the people that we need to convince. But we do need to go further. We, we need to, it's all very well talking about hypothetical values or numbers on paper, and particularly in ecosystem valuation, there's so many, so many articles and papers and policy briefs that talks about billions of euro or billions of kroner or billions of pounds or billions of dollars. But so what? What about the Mr. Malutins? It's all very well giving them scientific papers or policy briefs with these big public benefits. But actually, we've got to translate that into real gains for the people who are responsible for ensuring that restoration happens. And here, 
I want to look at a uh, Mongolia example, the, the upper Tool Basin. And the Tool River is what supplies about 90% of the water supplies for Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. You can see it running down into Ulaanbaatar. Most of the key watershed area is covered by two protected areas, and then around them is used for extensive grazing by livestock herders. I, I don't I don't know if you know, I know Nina's done quite a lot of work in Mongolia. I've used it widely, but I don't, I don't know if you know, in, in Mongolia, basically livestock dominate. The, the national human population of Mongolia is about three and a half million people. And in the 2018 livestock census, there were 66.5 million livestock. So there you go. That, that's the ratio. Now, Ulaanbaatar is suffering from a horrific, looming water crisis. Demand is rising. Water supplies are falling. And one of the reasons that water supplies are falling, particularly seasonally, I mean, it's a seasonality that's the issue, is because of wide scale degradation in, in the upper catchment. And so there's a crying need to restore the forest and grasslands in the upper tool catchment. And at this point in time, this is the early 2000s, well, it's about 2010, 2011, there was a huge amount of funding being put into water infrastructure development in Ulaanbaatar. Was any of it being put into water natural infrastructure investments? No, it was all being put into pipes and reservoirs and bore poles and pumps. So here was the need to say, you also need to invest in not just restoring the physical grey water infrastructure for Lenbatur, but you need to invest in restoring the natural water infrastructure in the Upper Tool Basin. And there's a huge economic cost to failing to restore that natural infrastructure. And there's a huge economic return on investment to putting that investment into ecological and ecosystem restoration. But it's a bit like Mr. Malutin on a bigger scale. Who incurs the costs? Who gains? Who gains? It's the water users and industries in Ulaanbaatar. Who incurs the costs of restoration? It's the protected area management authorities and it's the livestock herders who must modify and reduce and control their grazing patterns to maintain ecosystem integrity and restore it. So you've got a classic trade off between public interest and private returns. Of course, it's in the public interest to restore and conserve the upper tool. But it's not in the interest of the herders who manage its land and resources and must restrict their activities. And OK, the protected area authorities have a mandate to conserve biodiversity and ecosystems, but they only have about a third of the budget that requires them to do it. So however big those ecosystem restoration benefits are for downstream water users. If we can't capture some of those values and return them as a protected area budget and tangible conservation rewards to the herding community, then that ecological restoration isn't going to happen. Looking at that restoration link, you've got the water ecosystem services being provided very clearly but nothing being factored in to reward or compensate the costs that are being incurred. Now, in this case, what was proposed and is being piloted is some kind of a payment for ecosystem services to provide the finance and protected area authorities and the incentives to the herding communities to offset and reward the restoration costs. So looking at the flow of benefits and looking at how do we capture these values from the beneficiaries, the water consumers, via their monthly water bills, which they already pay to the water supply and sewage department. Can we take a portion of this and put it into an extra budgetary fund, which can be then returned to the people who bear the costs of restoration via budget transfers from protected area authorities and direct cash payments and conservation rewards and incentives to the upstream communities.
So taking the concept of making the economic and business case to its natural and necessary conclusion, demonstrating restoration values in paper, it's really important, but it's not the same as making a convincing business case. Making a convincing business and economic case means capturing those values and reinvesting them in restoration to make it viable but also to make it sustainable over the long term. I think we've all seen a wonderful ecosystem restoration initiatives, which cease at the end of the project period, at the end of the immediate investment period. There's no long-term plan for financial sustainability. Right, I have 22 seconds left to say my conclusion. If we're going to move forward in building a convincing case for restoration, we do have to look at the economic aspects. Economic aspects are only one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but they're an important one. We have to start addressing this problem of chronic ecosystem undervaluation, which hinders decision making and perverts decision making by resulting in misinformed decision making. Our economic arguments and evidence can sometimes be enough. But we have to move beyond that. We've got to tailor that evidence to the context, the practical and policy purpose. And we've got to make restoration actually viable and sustainable for all concerned. I think we've really moved forwards on the ecosystem service valuation side. We're getting some really good information. But where globally we're still falling short is actually designing and delivering the real incentives and financing mechanisms, which will actually enable and encourage and empower people to invest in ecosystem restoration. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the pleasure and the privilege of being asked to talk to you.